Lawrence must love it. The, the city that tried to arrest him and put him in jail for publishing that book is now honoring him. I hope all the kids who marched yesterday know that story. I was reading his biography um, coming over on, the, on Bard and thinking about the fact that he was orphaned uh, so young and had really a scary childhood being shunted from one relative to another and that that story was quite similar to the story of Kenneth Rexroth's childhood in South Bend, Indiana, who was also orphaned and lost his parents. And both of them ended up in, they survived in their imaginations. And they ended up in San Francisco and they gave the gift of this culture to us. Um, so here's Lawrence on the city. I was gonna read his poem about making peace with Ezra Pound, but thought San Francisco should be our theme. The Green Street Mortuary Marching Band marches right down Green Street and turns into Columbus Avenue where all the cafe sitters at the sidewalk cafe table sit talking and laughing and looking right through it as if it happened every day in little old wooden North Beach, San Francisco, but at the same time feeling thrilled by the stirring sound of the gallant marching band as if it were celebrating life and never heard of death. And right behind it comes the open hearse with the closed casket and the big frame picture under glass propped up showing the patriarch who had just croaked. <laughs> and now all seven members of the Green Street Mortuary Marching Band with the faded gold braid on their beat up captain's hats raise their bent axes and start blowing all more or less together and out comes onward Christian soldier like you never heard like you heard it once upon a time only, much slower with a dead beat. And now you see all the relatives behind the closed glass windows of the long black cars and their faces are all shiny, like they've been weeping with washcloths and all super serious, like as if the bottom had just dropped out of their private markets. And there's the widow all in weeds and the sister with the bent frame and the mad brother who never got through school and Uncle Louie with the wig. And there they all are assembled together and facing each other maybe for the first time, but their masks and public faces are all in place as they face outward behind the traveling corpse up ahead and oompa, oompa goes the band very slow and the trombones and the tuba and the trumpets and the big bass drum and the corpse hears nothing. Or, any, or everything, and it's glorious autumn day in Old North Beach, if only he could have lived to see it, only we wouldn't have had the band who half an hour later came, can be seen straggling back silent along the sidewalks, looking like hungover, broken down Irish bartenders dying for a drink or a last hurrah. So while I was thinking about those guys and this city, I thought of another magical poem, San Francisco poem. This is Kenneth Rexroth in 1940 on a Christmas Eve in San Francisco when it snowed in Golden Gate Park. And it's called Leda Hidden for the old story of Leda and the Swan. Christmas Eve unseasonably cold. I walk in Golden Gate Park. The winter twilight thickens. The park grows dusky before the usual hour. The sky sinks close to the shadowy trees and sky and trees mingle in receding planes of vagueness. The wet pebbles on the path wear little frills of ice like minute transparent fungus. Suddenly, the air is full of snowflakes, cold, white, downy feathers that do not seem to come from the sky but crystallize out of the air. The snow is unendurably beautiful, falling in the breathless lake, floating in the yellow rushes. I cannot feel the motion of the air, but it makes a sound in the rushes and the snow falling through the weaving blades makes another sound. I stand still 
breathing as gently as I can and listen to these two sounds and watch the web of frail, wavering motion until it is almost night. I walk back along the lake path, pure white with the new snow. Far out into the dusk, the unmoving water is drinking the snow out of the thicket of winter cattails, almost at my feet, thundering and stamping his wings, a huge white swan plunges away. He breaks out of the tangle and floats, floats suspended on gloom. Only his invisible black feet move in the cold water. He floats away into the dark until he is a white blur, like a face lost in the night, and then he is gone. All the world is quiet and motionless except for the fall and whisper of snow. There is nothing but night and the snow and the odor of frosty water. Another gorgeous thing. So then I was thinking about the stories of the city, the legacy of those guys. And it reminded me of a beautiful little essay written for a volume uh, published by Bancroft Library honoring Lawrence years ago. It's Joanne Kiger having, rest her, having uh, just arrived uh, with a new bachelor's degree from the University of California at Santa Barbara and hits San Francisco. I would say to Joanne and to Gary, how, did, how come you all knew each other? How did that happen? He, she, she, and he's, she said, there were very few freaks. <laughs> when I arrived in San Francisco in the early spring of 1957, I'd lived in Santa Barbara for the previous eight years, finishing school at the University of California. Everyone said, oh, you should have been here last year. That was when it was really happening. It's all over now. But I was 23 years old, and the present seemed happening enough for me. The San Francisco Renaissance was dramatically in the air. At the place, a tiny but famous writer's bar at 1546 Grant Avenue in North Beach, run by a former Black Mountain College student, Leo Krikorian, I met many kindred souls my own age. Beer was 25 cents a glass. Black Mountain College had closed the year before, and a group of its students traveled from North Carolina to gather around Robert Duncan, who had taught there, and Jack Spicer, an old friend from San Francisco in Berkeley. Among this group were John Wieners, Joe Dunn, Ebby Beauregard, Michael Rumaker, Harvey Harmon, and the painters Tom Field and Paul Alexander. Joining the group were George Stanley from San Francisco, Harold and Dora Dull, Richard Brodigan from Washington State, David Meltzer from Venice. These are all the photographs of Chris's, right? Uh, Ron Lowenson from San Francisco in the Philippines an informal writing group, both penetrating and scurrilous, met on Sunday afternoons with Duncan and Spicer. Spicer was very anti-beat, feeling that the movement was fueled by a need for publicity. When John Dunn, Joe Dunn founded the White Rabbit Press at Spicer's suggestion to publish writers who interested him, they decided to refuse to let City Lights distribute their books. <laughs> that was what I wanted to bring you to this wonderful moment when the poetry wars are happening and, and White Rabbit Press is refusing to deal with City Lights Press. So here is a piece of mine about uh, photography and San Francisco. It's called The Harbor at Seattle. This is 20 years after Joanne arrives in Berkeley. They used to meet one night a week at a place on top of Telegraph Hill to explicate Pound's cantos. Peter, who was a scholar, and Linda, who could recite many of the parts of the poem that envisioned paradise, and Bob, who wanted to understand the energy and surprise of its music, and Bill, who knew Greek and could tell them that Diocese, whose terraces were the color of stars, was a city in Asia Minor mentioned by Herodotus. And that winter, when Bill had locked his front door and shot himself in the heart with one barrel of a 12-gauge browning over and under, the others remembered the summer nights after a long session of work when they would climb down the steep stairs that negotiated the cliff where the hill faced the waterfront to go somewhere to get a drink and talk. 
The city was all lights at that hour, and the air smelled of coffee and the bay. In San Francisco, coffee is a family business and a profitable one, so that members of the families are often on the society pages of the newspaper, which is why Linda remembered the wife of one of the great coffee merchants who had also killed herself. It was a memory from childhood, from those first glimpses of a newspaper, the first glimpses a newspaper gives of the shape of the adult world, and it mixed now with her memory of the odor of coffee and the salt air. And Peter recalled that the new Museum of Modern Art had a photograph of that woman by Minor White. They had all seen it. She had bobbed hair and a smart suit on with sharp lapels and padded shoulders, and her skin was perfectly clear. Looking directly into the camera, she doesn't seem happy, but she seems confident. And it's as if Minor White understood that her elegance because it was a matter of style, was historical. Because behind her was an old barn, which is the real subject of the picture, the grain of its wood planking so sharply focused that it seems alive, grays and blacks in a rivery and complex pattern of venation. The back of Telegraph Hill was not always so steep. At the time of the earthquake, Building materials were scarce, so coastal ships made a good thing of hauling lumber down from the northwest. But the economy was paralyzed. There were no goods to take back north, so they dynamited the side of the hill and used the blasted rock for ballast. And then, in port again, they dumped the San Francisco rock in the water to take on more lumber, and that was how they built the harbor in Seattle. Thank you very much.